Welcome everyone. It's 12.30 now, so I might just get started. Thank you for coming. Um, this session is recorded, and um, towards the end, we'll have question and answer. If you have a few things need to be clarified, um, just let me know, uh, or we can also have a group discussion. So welcome to the first session of Quick, uh, quick Byte Talk. Um, I'm holding my mobile device. This is my note. Um, the session is about open access publishing, but more importantly, with the focus of uh, predatory publishers and how to avoid them. My name is Ludwig Sugiri. I'm uh, an academic liaison librarian. So a little bit about the session today. Um, from the session today, you will learn a few things. One is the introductory uh, explanation of open access and the benefits of open access. Um, and of course, uh, some of the problems with open access, especially uh, in the past few years where uh, the term open access becomes more popular uh, and, and why there are some predatory publishers using the open access term um, to try and attract scholars to publish with uh, these predatory publishers. So we'll talk about some aspects of uh, how you can identify those bad publishers. Um, so to start with this session, um, we're going to talk a little bit about what is the difference between open and free. Um, with the advance of information now and online technology, you can find so much just by using your browser. Um, some of the information are, of course, useful. Some are not. Um, what's interesting about this is uh, not everything that is free is actually scholarly. Uh, the concept of open access is actually not only free, but it, uh, it ena enable the users or whoever find the information to then reshare or reuse the, the information. Uh, this is different to uh, when you have just a copyright where you can cite or you can acknowledge the source, but you don't have the ability to share the information. This is where uh, an aspect of uh, different sets of licenses that's called Creative Commons uh, comes into play. Uh, and Creative Commons licenses, they're not replacing copyright, but it's based on copyright and it gives you, give the user uh, more um, ability to do with the information. And we're going to look at uh, Creative Commons licenses in, in this slide. So at the very bottom icon on the chart, is the copyright symbol. Uh, this is where if you have a work or a research that you publish, you are the author and you have the copyright. And um, within that line, you see there's only one tick. Oh yes, you can see it quite clearly. Uh, that one tick means user can quote and cite the research but you can't, you can't distribute or use that in any commercial sense. Uh, this, is, this is why Creative Commons is different to copyright. It allows you to, for example, the very top one, uh, to share or to reuse the information, or even sometimes uh, to distribute commercially or redistribute commercially. And of course, if you, as the author, prefer not to be able to, uh, users to be able to use your research in commercial sense. You don't have to go with that particular license. You can have a different type of license which still allow other researchers or anyone to read and distribute or circulate the information, but not for commercial purpose. So there are different types of licenses uh, with Creative Commons. And why is this important in open access movement? is because when, uh, when you want your research to be uh, acknowledged or reach a wider 
uh, audience or reader or research uh, outside your country, for example, uh, this Creative Commons license, sets of licenses, allows other people to use it. Now, how does it um, apply in the scholarly publishing context? So, if a researcher uh, produces a research and uh, typically you want that research to be published uh, so that other researchers or other uh, institutions uh, can learn about it, you find a publisher to publish that uh, piece of work. Uh, and of course, you don't want just any publisher, you want a reputable publishers so that your work can be more recognized, more people read that uh, research. Uh, the, the interesting part of this is once you sign an agreement with a publisher, the publisher, uh, the, your work is then protected, which is good in a way. Your work is protected. But the downside of that means only some people can access the work. Now, you probably don't um, realize, or maybe you do realize, when you do your uh, literature search, or if you want to find um, a current research using library database, uh, you look through, uh, you put your keywords, and then you see full text uh, article that you can just access through library catalog. Um, those articles from online databases are some of them, or probably most of them, are coming from commercial publishers where the library have subscription uh, to access those. So staff and students have the, the ability, because you're part of the university, uh, have access through your Unikey, the Authenticate. Uh, so that's part of the license that the publishers uh, sell by subscription to big institutions who can afford uh, access. So imagine if you are in a different country where uh, the, the wage is very low. Maybe one day you know, of working seven days, you earn a dollar, uh, or maybe you earn a dollar a day. Uh, so the economic situation is really hard. Uh, in that situation, how can you, if you're uh, trying to find the most current research, access this information, this valuable information? Um, because you don't have the money to pay a subscription. This is where Creative Commons um, becomes and has become um, an alternative solution for this. Because of the open access, if your research is published through open access publisher, anyone, any scholars, can learn your research, no matter where they are, as long as they have uh, internet or online connection, they can read, they can improve their economic or well-being or health, or even, or even um, their policy, which is great. Uh, but again, just to contrast, if you publish through reputable publishers, there is some limitation of how users can use that research or distribute it. Now, I talk a little bit about the problem with open access. Uh, since we now understand that there is ability to distribute or circulate the information with Creative Commons, um, there are some people out there uh, who are trying to imitate this business model, and we call them predatory publishers. Um, I'm going to show you why this is quite important for every scholar to understand. Um, basically, they uh, approach scholars uh, perhaps by scamming or the use of uh, soliciting um, your research by uh, sending, I don't know, several hundred emails. And then you, you probably think, OK, I need my, my work to be published, uh, and this seems to be an opportunity. Um, that's the sort of things that they try to get your research published through, through them, um, but it's actually a scam. Uh, I'll, I'll show you in a minute of examples of why, why this is important, and it has happened, and it's still happening throughout the world. 
So what we want is not just open access publishers. We want reputable open access publishers, not the rest of the open access publishers who are not credible. This is a chart uh, to illustrate why open access is beneficial. Um, I've mentioned some of this already, so more exposure to your work, of your work, and then um, higher citation rates of your, your research, because your research it can be uh, distributed or circulated because of the Creative Commons, and so more people read it. Uh, and, and if you think, oh, is this really right? Uh, if I put my work in uh, open access, uh, I will get higher citation rates. Uh, there is a recent uh, publication research, uh, uh, in fact, that's only a few weeks ago, um, that's done about, about the impact of open access. Uh, I'll show you the, the link to the article at, at the end of this presentation. Um, on the left, you see the piggy bank icon that says taxpayers get value for money, and under that it says compliant with grant rules. Uh, so yes, it is a policy, so if you apply for uh, Australian grant, uh, in one of the clause, uh, it states that you should put your work in the open access publishing, uh, publisher or repository. And of course, as I mentioned um, earlier, researchers in developing countries can see your work. So talking about compliance, uh, this is from excerpt from ARC and, and, and him, sorry, NHMRC, uh, the two major funders for Australian research. So the first one says, any publication arising from ARC and NHMRC supported research project uh, must be deposited into an open access institutional repository within 12 months. Uh, and of course, uh, there are some cases where that's not applicable, um, but you need to state why. So this is an example of open access article. Uh, Professor Deborah Schofield uh, from Faculty of Pharmacy, uh, Chair, of Professor, Chair and Professor of Health Economics. Uh, there's an article by, by Deborah Schofield, uh, and, and you can find this article actually only the citation, uh, the reference from, from Deborah's profile from Sydney Uni. Um, so imagine if you're a researcher elsewhere and you see this profile and you see uh, the most current publication. This was last year, but I know uh, Professor Schofield has uh, produced many more since then. Um, but imagine if you don't have access to this expensive databases. Uh, you can simply look for this particular article by using your internet browser. Um, so you can just simply copy and paste it, Google search, and you can find it. In fact, I'm going to uh, demonstrate, if I, I think I have time, so I'm just going to demonstrate uh, how I look for this particular open access article. Okay, so. Oh, it's okay, I'm just going to Google it. Oh, it's not okay, there we go. Thank you. So this is the profile of Professor Scofield, uh, and then you have, you see the, the selected grants and selected publication. I'm going to see the journal publications in 2015. It was, excuse me. 
the impact of diabetes. I'm just going to Google it straight away. Okay, this is the article. Um, oh, I should have prepared this earlier. Um, that's not the actual article and it impacts that one. There's a section here um, that, that actually states that this article is part of the, uh, the grant, uh, the ARC grant. Um, so this, uh, this is, uh, I'm trying to demonstrate uh, the policy compliance. So when, when you have a research grant and this, uh, this research is part of that, um, then you put it in the open access. How do you know if this is a, an open access uh, publisher? Uh, this is published uh, by PMC. And yes, it does say it's copyright, but uh, in the next section, it will say that uh, this article is distributed under Creative Commons, which means you can email it to your colleagues, you can share it on your social media, for example, um, which is uh, impossible if you access this database through uh, a pay license. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the two kind of open access, the green and gold. Um, the gold app open access is uh, the best option, uh, but this involves article processing charge, which means uh, when you're ready to, or when you're writing a grant, or when you're looking for funding for your project, uh, always think about uh, what will you do with your research? If you're going to publish it through open access, then you should include that in your, in your grant that uh, you need uh, a certain amount of money from the grant to be used for article processing charge. This is basically a fee that is determined by open access publishing. Uh, so when you submit your work and after it's being peer reviewed and accepted, uh, the open access publisher will charge uh, the article processing charge, just a one off charge, and then that work will be made available, open access. The green open access uh, is basically a self archiving option. So if you already publish several research articles through uh, um, a certain publication, um, you can check the status of uh, those publishers, whether they allow you as the author to self-archive or to put those research, a copy of the research in the open access or in the repository uh, so, so that people can access them. So these are the two different kinds of open access. Both are good. With the green open access, no charge are payable. Um, uh, the, gold app, the gold app on access uh, has the APC or article processing charge. So the next section is uh, about how you can how you can find out if you're being approached by a publisher and you wonder, I've never heard of this publisher before or, or this uh, journal before and it's asking me to publish with them. Um, there are a few things that you can, can do. You can search uh, Ulrich's web. Uh, and in fact, towards the end, if we have time, I'll demonstrate this. So Ulrich's web will, uh, will allow you to search the name of the publisher and see if it appears on that list, whether that, 
uh, all requests uh, identify or recognize the name uh, and whether uh, whether uh, they allow online archiving. Sherpa Remia is a, another website where you can check the status of uh, self-archiving. So this is to do with the green open access. So if you want to know uh, your previous publication, you want to make them open access, you can check the status of those publications uh, using the Sherpa Romeo. And uh, the last uh, link, which is uh, very useful, to check the open status of that publisher. Um, any publishers that claim that they're uh, open access publishing should be registered in this website, Directory of Open Access Journal. Uh, this one? Uh, we'll have uh, a few minutes for questions later on if you can wait and so I can finish the slides. <laughs> but we'll have a discussion and questions. Um, these are lists of things how you can spot predatory publishers. This is from Jeffrey Beale's website. Jeffrey Beale is a librarian uh, and he has listed many publishers that are uh, predatory and he has a list of criteria, and these are only some of them. So if the publisher doesn't have ISSN or International Standard for Serial Numbers, uh, that seems suspicious. Or if they offer uh, a very quick peer review process, or if they said by paying extra, you'll get your research published quicker, uh, you, should, you should question that. Um, the next few slides are examples of uh, media coverage about uh, predatory publishers. Um, sometimes the, the publishers also disguise or participate in predatory conferences. Uh, this happens in Japan. Uh, this is an interesting case about uh, Health Canada and predatory publishers. I'm not going to go into details about, about the article. Uh, this is from Radio National, ABC. It says, Bogus uh, Scholarly Society agrees to publish papers without peer review. Vanity and predatory and corrupt um, in the pursuit of knowledge. Uh, another example of someone who is very famous, Professor Peter Doherty, uh, decided not to attend uh, a conference because the conference is basically a scam. More news. And this is a chart of the number of predatory articles and um, predatory journals. So in 2010, there are 53,000 online articles, online as in free, but they're not necessarily scholarly because they're published through these predatory journals. And in 2014, the number climbed up to 420,000. Um, and this is the latest figures. In 2016, the number of predatory publishers and uh, journals. This chart is the distribution of predatory in certain subject or discipline. And we're almost finished with the discussion about open access, but this is a short quiz. Uh, if you have seen this, don't tell your colleague. Uh, just by looking at the title, see if you can spot which one is the predatory without Googling. I can tell you it's more, I, I have listed more than two predatory publishers or journals. Would you like to see the answer now? So number one, two, three, four, they're actually real journals. Number five to 12, despite of their name, so how it sounds, they're predatory according to 
uh, the research and according to Jeffrey Bill's list. Um, how do you determine whether they're predatory or not? Uh, the criteria is on Jeffrey Bill's list and in fact uh, there are many research about predatory publishers, uh, whether uh, you know shonky process of uh, peer review or um, it doesn't have ISSN, it's not recognized or maybe the editorial board doesn't exist or check who, who is editing the work and who's the chief editor. Uh, what's their background? What's the criteria? What's the reputation? Are they also scholars? Um, so those are the things that you need to have a, have a think about before deciding where to publish. Um, I'm happy to make these slides available for you if you're interested to read this more carefully. Like I said, there are uh, many websites talking about how to avoid predatory publishers. Uh, that one is from Indiana University, which is also very useful. And if you have questions about open access in general, um, these two websites are very useful as well. And so the talk that I uh, give today is based on two um, research. Uh, one is by Shannon Bjork and the other one, which is the, the most current, by Tennant and um, his associates. So um, that's the end of the presentation. Um, I'm happy to try to answer the question. I have to uh, announce my disclaimer. I'm not the expert in open access. Uh, and in fact, I also invite people to have a discussion or if I can't answer, please contribute to discussion. So uh, would you like me to go back to the previous slides? Uh, please tell me which one I think it was. Oh, oh yes, yes. Is it this one? Yeah. So uh, these tools are just tools. I'm not saying that um, if, if it's listed there, that it's definitely, definitely good journal. Um, the same with Jeffrey Bill's list, because uh, uh, in any rigorous scholarly debate, uh, we can have different opinions. Um, for example, I saw a blog in, uh, so Jeffrey Bill's blog where he, criticize uh, certain um, open access journal which, uh, which, which is considered uh, scholarly and really good rep uh, have, have really good reputation. Um, but he's really uh, quite sharp in his criticism. But um, other scholars contribute to the discussion and explain why, why he's wrong. So I agree that um, not everything that's listed um, on these tools are necessarily the best. Uh, the same with Jeffrey Bill's list of predatory publishers. They're not necess uh, it's an indication. Um, in the end, uh, you should make the best decision by using this information. If in doubt, um, always check with your research manager. Um, consult with your colleagues as well. Uh, um, so yes, so I'll take uh, your comment on that. Thank you.